Good morning. Welcome to Prayer Lakes Church. I'm glad to be here on the spring break weekend. How about you? Hey, and I just want to clarify a few things, okay? You and I has not changed their colors to lavender. Still purple. That's all I got, okay? Hey, um, one other thing I want to clarify. At Prairie Lakes Church, we want to make it impossible for people of Iowa to get to hell. In Iowa, Iowa basketball wants to make Iowa, Iowa, Iowa State, you and I basketball want to make it impossible for other teams to get to the Sweet 16. <laughs> I'm pleasing the crowd right now. Hey, we are, uh, we're delighted you're here. We got a whole bunch of people watching online. We've got campuses on different corners of Iowa. We get to do this together, which is really a privilege. So we're delighted you're here. And for all of those of you who are watching online, we just encourage you, just uh, take notes, really focus in, pray. And uh, some of you are on vacation and you're watching. We really appreciate that. So, so good job on that. All right, let's do what we always get to do right now. Let's get our Bibles out, okay? And I, I know, honestly, I know some of you are like, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't like to do that. But I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm short of begging right now, okay? I'm really encouraged, just grab one of the Bibles around you, okay? And I'm gonna be in one spot. And I think it's really important that, that, that you kind of sit in this story with me. I'm gonna do it a little bit different this weekend. And, and so I want, it's just a value, I think, of you kind of sitting there with me. So if you get a Bible out, use your phone if you want to. Uh, we encourage you to do that. Um, and then the second thing is this, the ushers are coming down right now and uh, there's a great place to take notes. So if you don't have a pen, just raise your hand, balcony and down here, just raise your hand. Uh, they'll get to you um, and with a pen. So uh, while that's going on, let, let's, let's, let's just kind of get going. I, I, really wanna, I really wanna pound away at this. Um, so just a quick, quick review here, okay? Um, we're in this series called What Love Does, and the whole idea of this What Love Does series is it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of funneling us into next weekend, which is Easter. Easter is the greatest picture of love, right? What Jesus did for us on Good Friday, and then what he did for us on, 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 on Sunday the, to, to defeat death or sit on the cross and defeat death in the grave, our two greatest enemies. It is, it is the, it's the greatest weekend of the year for us. It's awesome. And, and, and so it's this, this picture of love that you just can't miss, all right? So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, let's walk into Easter and we want you to just see what this love does. What, what, what was Jesus really like? How is, how is his love different than love that we experience kind of, kind of on, a, on, a, on, a, on a level, an earthly level? How is it different? And there are some of us that, that kind of have this so mixed up and there are many of, of your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers and your relatives who have this, this love of God thing so screwed up that, that, they, that they've pushed God away because they don't quite understand. And what we wanna do is help you understand and get them on your arm next weekend so they can see this love in action. So that's what we're doing. So last weekend, Pastor Eric started this. He just did a great job, but he went to the story of Peter. So do you remember when Jesus, right before he was crucified, right on that night that he was arrested, Jesus, Peter said, I'll never, I'll never let you down. Jesus, I got your back all the time. And Jesus said, well, actually, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times tonight. And, and he did it. And, and this, there's this just poignant uh, a verse that just says, and, and Peter went out. And here's the words that it uses. It says, he wept bitterly, right? Wept bitterly. He was so filled with shame, so filled with shame in what he'd done. And what Jesus does in John 21 is Jesus restores Peter. And so here's what we talked about last week. What love does, it overcomes our shame and it restores our purpose. And if, you, if you've been bullied by shame all of your life, um, this is a great message for you just to go back and just watch and sit in it. Because none of us ought to live in, 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 in that kind of shame. Guilt from God is really good because guilt from God pushes us forward. But shame that says you're worthless Shame that says you stink, shame that says you're awful, that's not where God, that's not from God, that's from somewhere else. So, so go back and, and review that one and watch it online if you would. So here's what we're going to do. I want everybody, if you would, just go to Mark 5, okay? So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Go to Mark 5, and we're going to just sit in, in this passage. I'm hardly going to go anywhere else. So sit in Mark 5, and, and I want you to see something before we, before we go to part two of what love does. I want you to see in Mark 5 what, what kind of happens here, what Mark's doing. So right in this section of kind of the end of 4 um, and the beginning of 5 and, and the rest of 5 where we're going to be, Mark's given us this, this picture. He's telling us about the power of Jesus. So what Mark's trying to do is he's trying to get his audience, these people who he's, who he's writing to, he's trying to get them to see that this Jesus is more powerful than anything on the face of the earth. He's more powerful than all things. He overcomes everything. And so he's really given this picture of the power of Jesus. So look at the end of chapter four 
And this is the story where, where Jesus calms the storm, right? Where, where he's in the boat and, and, he, and he says, be still to the water. And what that shows us is Mark saying, I want you to see this progression. Mark's saying that Jesus has power over nature. So he, so he tells the story where Jesus says to the storm, stop, and the storm stops. That's the power of Jesus. Then go to the beginning of chapter five and, and he tells another story. And this is when he go, Jesus goes across the lake and there's this demon-possessed man that's been, that's been wreaking havoc on this city and on this village and on this area because he's, he's out of control and he's crazy. And, and, and Jesus comes in and he, and he, and he casts out the, 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 the demons out of this man and they jump in the herd of pigs and all this stuff happens, right? But, but what's, Paul, what's Mark doing? Mark's saying, not only does he have power over nature, but he's got power over our enemy, Satan, who's always seeking to kill and steal and destroy. Jesus has power over him. Then you go over to verse 21, and this is the story that we're going to be in. What we're going to see, Mark continues this power theme of Jesus when he says, not only nature and Satan, but Jesus has power over disease, and he even has power over death. So that's the context of, of, of this passage in Mark 5. Now, here's what I want to do just a little bit different this weekend. Here are your notes right there. They're all filled out for you, Okay. So, so this is just going to stay up here, and, and I'll add some things in as we go, but this is really the gist of it, because we're answering the question, even taking a little, a little raising the level, but what is the, this love does? What this love does? This love of Jesus, what does it does? Overcomes the depth of our position, our problem, and restores our identity. So this is going to be the note, so just get those down. And I also want you to, to, to write this down. Write down Luke 8 at the top of your notes. That's the parallel passage to Mark 5. And, and Luke 8, he, Luke just fills in. They're very similar, but they, 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 they have a little different way that they're pointing the story to. So it's a good fill-in, but we're going to stick in, in Mark 5. Now, uh, here's, what, here's what I, I want to do. I want to just sit in the story. This is, um, there's something about this one. I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, no, I, I think I do. I take that back. I mean, all of Scripture is God-breathed, and, and all, all the pictures of Jesus are, are just over the top. We can't even begin to plumb the depths of, of Jesus and his love for us. We can't even begin to. But there's something about this story. There, there's something about this story, what Jesus does in this spot, that just, it, somehow it just it goes to the very deepest part of who I am. And I think it does for a lot of us, and I think it will for a lot of us. And, and my, my reason, I, I think my reason is, is because um, I, I, I know what it's like um, to, be, to be full of sin and get to that, that point where you, you're sick of yourself and you, you're hopeless. You're in a spot where you just, you just don't know if there's ever going to be a change or if, if there's any point to even living, if there's any point to purpose to life. And, and, and I think a lot of us feel that way or have been there. And, and, if, and if it's not you right now, there's somebody in your circle that's just wondering and, and they're asking, is there any way to get out of this? Is there any way to fix this one? And this is the story of, uh, of hopelessness. But it gives this picture, and the picture of this, this power of Jesus, it, it gives us this picture of this love and what this love does. Now the crazy thing about Matthew or, or Mark 5 here, beginning of verse 21, is it's two stories. It's a story within a story. We're going to focus on the within story but let's start at the top and let's walk down it together. And again, we're just gonna, I just wanna walk in the story, okay? So, so here's Mark and here, here's the story that he tells us in the midst of telling us about the power of Jesus. So look what it says in verse 21. It says, so when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Now make sure we kind of understand the whole context. Notice what's just been happening. Jesus has shown his power over nature just before this, the night or two before this, and Jesus showed his power over the enemy, Satan, and, and, and it's crazy, and the word is out now, this Jesus and what he's doing, right? So he's not gonna go anywhere where there's not a crowd around him, where the, where the calls to, to grab him and touch him and, and, and be with him are there, and, 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 and so it says, and it gives us this picture, that they were gathered and they were around him while he was by the lake. So as, so as soon as he gets off the boat, there's the crowd and, and they're all waiting for him. And, and, and there's, 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 um, it's, it's hectic and it's busy and it's noisy and, and everybody wants something from Jesus. They want to just see him. They, they want to take a selfie with him. They want him. Verse 22 now digs down. It says, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus 
came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now just, just for a minute, sit in this spot. You know, the people who gave Jesus the most trouble were the really religious people, right? They were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Jesus was always... He was always banging his head against them. They were always trying to trip him up. In fact, as we walk through the Passion Week and as you walk through this week in your, in your readings, what you're going to see is they're the ones who are just, they just can't stand him anymore. They're doing anything they can to get him. And, and, and so they incite the crowd and they pay Judas 30 pieces of silver to, to, to um, um, uh, betray him. And, 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 and so they, they just, these, were, these were his mortal enemies. Now, not all of them, right? In John 3, Nicodemus comes to him, and, and we, see, we see at the end of John, we see Nicodemus back in the picture helping Jesus in his burial, okay? Not all of them were like that, but, but that was the general conflict. So here's the picture. A guy who had all the respect of the world, a guy who, who, who was on that side of the, of the ledger, he was on, on, on the top half of the depth chart of life, he comes to Jesus and it says, and it says in Mark 5 and at Luke 8, it says that he, he fell at the feet of Jesus. I mean, literally comes up and falls at the feet of Jesus. And so you know what's going on. It's, 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 it's desperate. And this guy is setting everything aside, everything aside because he's got something that only Jesus can fix. So back to the story. So he, when he saw Jesus, he, he fell at his feet. Verse 23 says, and he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. I mean, there's a lot of deep holes in life, right? There's a lot of bad stuff that happens. We have relationships that just ache to the core of our being. Some of you have been burned deeply on, on, on relationships. We have, we have disease that, that strikes and, and wreaks havoc. We have, we have mental illness that, that, that crushes families. We, there's just a lot of bad things. But unless you've been there, there's this one that I don't think we can imagine. And some of you, some of you are in this club and it's the club of parents who've had to bury a child. And we've walked alongside of lots of those over the years, and some of our very best friends are in that club, and it's the club nobody wants to be in. And here's this guy. What's most precious to him needs what only Jesus can bring. And so he falls at his feet before Jesus. And he just begs, because here's what he believes. That if Jesus can just lay his hands on my daughter and pray for her, she won't die, she'll live. And so the text says, so Jesus went with him. Now here's the story within the story now. A large crowd followed and pressed around him and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. So now the, 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 the story starts to kind of tighten now. Now we're going to switch gears and, 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 and go to the story in the middle now. So Jesus is on the way, right? And this is a mission. This is desperate. This synagogue leader has humbled himself. He's dropped. He said, you're the only one who can help. Would you do it? And Jesus says, yes, I will. And, and we got to go. And you can just imagine the urgency of, of getting to his daughter. And so while they're on the way, there was a woman in the crowd. And first of all, her just being in the crowd is a huge no-no. She's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, most of us get, we, most of us who we get a headache for a day, we're like, oh, shoot me, right? 12 years. And what that meant was that, 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 for 12 years, she had been on the opposite end of the depth chart than the synagogue leader. The synagogue leader is a deep insider. This lady who, because of her issue, was a deep outsider, buried so far down the depth chart that it wasn't even worthy of talking to her. By the rules, by the law, she was unclean. 
And if you were a good Jewish person and you were bump up against her, even just a casual touch because she's unclean, that automatically makes you unclean. Because she's dirty, now you're dirty. And because you're dirty, you have to go through and get yourself purified and you've got to sit out and, you've, and, and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's before God that you're unclean. And so anybody that this woman came in contact with, anybody, they become unclean. Here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the depth of, of, of here's the opposite of, of, of spectrums for them. Let me get, I'm just gonna do a real quick drawing here for you. Um, this, is, this was the temple where they worshiped, okay, the Temple Mount. And, and there was a large wall around it, and, and inside of it there was this, this first spot, this, the deepest and most precious spot was, was the Holy of Holies. And this is where the, the priest one time a year would go in and sacrifice. This is the place. Right, this is, this is it. They go and sacrifice on behalf of the people and, and only one person, the high priest at one time, was, was allowed to go in there. And then kind of around this was the court of priests, okay? The court of priests, and the only people who could even be this close had to be real legitimate priests. So then there was this, and there was a dividing spot, then there was a place right out here where, where um, this isn't specced, by the way, okay? Right out here where, where this is where the, where the Jewish men could go, okay? This is, where, this is where they could go. They couldn't get any closer if they weren't priests, but, but well, they could get awful close, okay? And then, and then out here, a, a, another level removed, this is where the, the, the Jewish women could go. This is where, where they could be. And then out here, farthest removed as possible, but yet still inside the Temple Mount, farthest removed as possible was the court of Gentiles. And do you remember when, when Jesus, the story of when, when Jesus um, that happens on the Passion Week, when, when, he, when he goes in and he sees them, you know, taking advantage of the travelers and the pilgrims and Jesus, Jesus overturns the tables? That this is where this happened, way out here, okay? So Jairus, he could get that close. The bleeding woman. And most likely only here. Friends, we've got to make sure that we hear this about this love. Because there are some of us, and there are, I can count on it, that there are some of your friends who feel like they're so far buried so deeply in the depth chart of society that, that the love of God couldn't reach them. that they were born on the wrong side of the tracks, that they were born with the wrong skin color, that they were born on the wrong side of the socioeconomic scale. And in fact, even now in our political season that we're in, those differences are being exacerbated and taken advantage of by almost all of our politicians. Pitting this group against this group insiders versus the outsiders and the haves and the have-nots and the, these people on this side and those people on that side and it's the, it's the conservatives versus the Republicans and they're both evil and it's the moderates versus the progressives and they're, and they're both evil and it's the women versus the men and the blue collar versus the white and, and, it, and it's the young versus the old and everything is a, everything is a, is a pit against each other. And on a, that's, a, that's just a microcosm picture of the way our whole world works, Right? Where do I stand? What's my place on the depth chart? And most of our lives are spent trying to, trying to get that one more step, trying to get that little more acceptable, trying to get to that, that little better spot and trying to move up the depth chart. And, and the crazy thing is that our society almost says this, the more I move up the depth chart, the more God loves me. The farther down the depth chart I am, the more God must not love me. And here's what we've got to see and you've got to make sure you understand this and that your friends do. It doesn't matter how far someone's buried down the depth chart. What this love does is it overcomes every position, whether you're high or whether you're low. This erases it. This erases all those barriers that somehow I'm more loved or I'm less loved. It buries it. What this love does is it overcomes whatever position that we're in on the depth chart of society. This does it. And here's the picture that Mark chooses to tell us in the middle of this man. This is Jesus, and look what he can do. 
This is Jesus and look what he can do. It doesn't matter. Your spot on the depth chart, whether you're at the top of the game or you're the end of the bench, it doesn't matter to Jesus. He loves you. And this message today and this message next weekend is you're loved and here's the very proof of it. That this Jesus went to the very cross for every person who's ever lived and ever will live. And he died for them. And on the cross, he defeated, he took their sin, he took your sin and mine, and he defeated that on the cross. And when he was in the grave, when he rose from the grave, he defeated death, which is our greatest enemy. That's love. And what this love does is overcome our, our, our position, it over, overcomes it. And, and, and it's not just that, though. Go, go a little bit farther and, and kind of start to feel the depth of this, right? We can, we can, we can begin with the synagogue group. We, we can begin to go, all of us who have children, because they, yeah, well, I, have, I had a kid that was sick, or maybe our kid was really sick, or maybe one of our kids was in an accident. But, but we, can, we can begin to taste a little bit of that. We can't go there if we haven't been there, but we can begin to taste it. But listen to what he says and how he describes now the depth of the problem of this bleeding woman. And a woman was there, verse 25, who'd been subject to bleeding for, for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So just, just think about that, just for a minute. A chronic illness that takes all of your money and every time someone promises, if you drink this or take that or do this or run this way or, or work out this way or, or, or eat this grasshopper poop or something, right? I don't know where that came from. That was weird. But every time, right, the hope goes up. Maybe this is it. This is going to be the fix. And every time, after 12 years... Not only had she lost all her money, she'd lost all her hope, and not only had she not gotten any better, she'd actually, if it's at all possible, gotten worse. And verse 27 says, and when she heard about Jesus, and what did she heard about Jesus, right? What did she heard? What's the most recent thing she'd heard? That he's got power over nature. And he even tells demons what to do. So surely he can take care of my problem. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And we get this unique insight into what was going on in here. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And before we go on, I just want to pause and just remind you of this. That this story within a story, the, the problems are very, very deep. Can't get much worse than a, your own kid dying. And it can't get much worse than 12 years of not only being sick, but being a cast out and being pushed away and pushed to the side and being someone who doesn't matter. Your name ceased to be Mary or Susie or Linda, your name became unclean. And your identity became unworthy. These are deep, deep problems. And one of the things that Mark is trying to, to show us here is not only does this love overcome your position on the depth chart and there's no respecter of status, but this love of Jesus it overcomes the depth of your problem. That, that Jesus isn't afraid of how bad it is or how deep it is or how far it's gone. Some of us think that because I've done so many bad things, because I've screwed up so bad, or because this has just gone on inside of me for so long, God must not love me. And part of the message that Mark wants to make sure that we understand and that the Holy Spirit inspired this Bible is this. That this love that Jesus has, it overcomes the depth of your problem. And what we know in reality is this, is that not everything always gets taken away or not everything always gets fixed, but here's what Jesus and this love will always do. 
He'll provide what you need at the time that you need it to get you through every moment of every day. He will provide. Paul, who, who struggled mightily with what he described as a, as a thorn in the flesh, right? And it wasn't really a thorn in the flesh. We think it was probably something wrong with his eyes that he couldn't see because several times he says, I'm writing with my own hand or see what big letters I write. Or he says a couple mentions, so we think it might be something with his, with his eyes, a painful eye condition. And he says, I pleaded with God three times to remove this from me. But then Jesus spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. He didn't get fixed, but he got grace. Now, my friends, just, just for a minute, see this and make sure that you think about the circle that you, that you live in, your friends and your family and your neighbors, your relatives, your coworkers. Maybe you. You lived your whole life, or at least the last part of it, wondering if this love that Jesus has counts for me because it doesn't feel like it. And I don't like the spot that I'm in. But we're going to see next. What we're going to see next is a picture of the greatest healing that can happen in all of us. So what does this love, what this love does is it overcomes our, the depth of our position and the depth of our problem. This is the key right here. So in verse 29, it, it, so, so she says in verse 28 at the end, it says, because she thought if, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And so she did it. She, she, this, this, this frail needle of a woman stitches her way through the crowd to just grab the hem of his garment. And in verse 29, it says, immediately her bleeding stopped and, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So, so do you see what happened? Jairus comes up and says, man, you got to help me. And, and you'll read the rest of the story later and you'll see that, that he does. And this lady thinks, man, if I, can, if I can just get to this Jesus, if I can just reach for him. And she does. And what happens is as soon as she touches him, as soon as she touches him and this, this faith that Jesus says, this is because of your faith, she's healed. Twelve years. She's healed. It would be the best thing ever, right? She's not supposed to be in the crowd anyway. She shouldn't be touching anybody. And if anybody would notice that it's her, they'd be yelling, unclean, unclean. And they'd all jump back like they're going to catch something. But she risks it. She risks a reach to Jesus. And so she comes to the crowd, hoping nobody notices her. Because she's so far buried on the depth chart. Maybe she can just sneak in. And she touches his clothes, his coat, and just touches him. Just, just this, right? Just this. And she knows right now. She's fixed. And the greatest thing for her would be to go, yes. Right? And go back and just praise God and spend all of your days knowing what, what God had done for you. And she'd been taught to shut up and be quiet and stick to the edges. Gosh, if Jesus would just listen to her, right? Verse 30. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. I don't quite know what that means, how that works, but when she touched him with that, with that reach of hope and faith, when she took the risk and she said, you're my only hope, Jesus. Something in Jesus went, woo. <laughs> I don't know, right? So he turned around in the crowd. Oh, no, don't do it, Jesus. Don't let her go. And he asked, who touched my clothes? Could you imagine her heart rate at that moment? And we don't, when we read it, um, we don't know tone a lot, right? Like, that's why you don't fight over text, people. Oh, I was just kidding. LOL. <laughs> the disciples say, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask who touched me? Like, right, you can, almost pretty snarky, I think, right? Because, you know, he's, he's, 
He's, he's, he's the celebrity, right? He's, he's moving through everybody like, you know, like today if uh, Peyton Manning walks through the airport, you know, just, just a wild guess of a name. <laughs> People are like, oh, look, there he is. Everybody wants to get himself in. They're all wanting to touch him, right? Same thing's happening with Jesus, even to a, to a bigger degree. And they're all pushing and rubbing up against him and touching him and patting him on the back, and right? Everybody is, but this one touch was different than all the rest. But Jesus kept looking, this is crazy, 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. (laughs) Can you just picture her just trying to, trying to like climb into a wormhole? Just sink, please don't see me. I don't want anybody to know, I don't want to get called out, I don't want anybody to know I'm here. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, same thing as Jairus. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Jesus wasn't calling her to accuse her. Jesus was calling to affirm her. Because though she had been healed physically, the real healing hadn't happened yet. Because what we know is God can fix our bodies, right? Amen, praise God. He can, he can and he does, and, 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 and he can fix them. But what we know is that our bodies, no matter what you do, are on a slow march to death. Amen? Can't help it. All of us. All of us. So he healed her body temporarily. But the healing wasn't complete until he did the most important healing. And this next sentence in here is, this is it for me. This next sentence is one you can kind of fly over because, oh, look what he did and look what happened, right? Look, look, look. But she trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth and then Verse 34 is it, this is it, this is, this is what love does. And Jesus speaks a word to her that is, he doesn't speak to anybody else in the rest of the Gospels. It's only used here. It's a term of endearment and respect. And here's this woman who is buried on the depth chart of life who risked the scorn again of everybody. And Jesus says this to her. Daughter. 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 For 12 years her name was dirty. For 12 years, her name was slut. For 12 years, her name was unworthy. For 12 years, she was in the position of left out, cast out, pushed aside, and kicked to the curb. For 12 years, nobody loved her. And in this one moment, Jesus not only heals her body, but he completes the healing when he says to her, daughter, and he restores her true identity. He he changes her name from sick to well, from unworthy to worthy, from unclean to clean, from outsider to insider. He says, you are no longer defined by what's wrong with you. You are now defined by this. You are mine and mine only, and you're my daughter, and I love you. Amen? He restores her identity. He healed her in the most important way. My friends, some of us live life thinking Jesus has forgotten about me 
Jesus has left me out. Jesus doesn't know or care. He doesn't even know I exist. There's this verse in Hebrews. I want you just to write the reference down, and it's going to be on the screen. And I, I want you to see this truth about this love of Jesus. Therefore, he, talking about Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him. And listen to this last part. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Do you know what Jesus' job is right now? The Bible tells us that he is at the right hand of the very throne of God. And here's what he does. He lives for this purpose because he loves you so much. He lives to intercede on your behalf. Here's what he's waiting for. All he's waiting for is you to drop before him. All he's waiting for you is to reach out and say nothing else matters except him. That's what Jesus does. That's what this love does. It overcomes whatever depth there is to your position or your problem. And most importantly, he restores your identity. You are his and he is yours. I'm going to pray. And right when I'm done praying, we're going to watch. There's going to be a song that we, we, um, we did last night that they couldn't be here this morning. But we want you just to sit and just watch it. Just listen to the words of this song, okay? And just sit in this moment. And then we'll close with a little bit of singing. Just one more song together. So let's pray. So God, here we are. We, uh, we're so grateful for this love and what this love does. And we are so humbled by it, God. All of us are that bleeding woman. All of us need you to heal us and heal us completely. And most importantly, our hearts. So Father, if there's anybody here or anybody listening or anybody watching at this very moment that needs their identity to rest in you, would you give them the courage to risk it and to reach out for you? We're thankful for your word and we're thankful for this love. And God, for next weekend we pray that there'll be a lot of people around Iowa that for the first time see how great your love really is for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.